everybody, can you hear my voice? Yes, a little else, Sam. Ah, tough shit, you got no choice. So grab a glass and sit back in your chair. Uncorked is going live to To the solar system, I give heat from a star they call Sun and SPF 40. To the planets, I give gravity and George Lucas. To the fish and mammals of my ocean, I give coral, great depths, John Williams and Steven Spielberg. To the lands of parched soil and sand, I give rivers of water and seasonal tourism. To the great beasts of the plains, I give great grasslands that never need to be mowed. To those that would soar in the skies, I gave them winds and wee tasty worms. And to the humans, I wrapped it all in one ether, one amber nectar that would teach them about balance. A liquid that demanded open-mindedness, fostered community and instilled humility in all who brought it to their lips, in those weird half-size Glencairn glasses. A spirit so powerful that just taking in this water of life would remind the humans of their place as guardians of all that is good in the world. And what do they do? Flip bottles out and fucking whiskey auction. And now they treat it like a goddamn cask investment opportunity. This is planet Earth. This is whiskey. And this is the World Whiskey Summit. Good evening and happy World Whiskey Day, everybody. Um, one boutique day, and hopefully <laughs> it was all working perfectly a little while ago. Ah, as it all goes wrong here. So, yeah, and for the next two hours, we're going to take you. Well, we're not going to take you anywhere, sadly, but um, so beam it to your smart TV, like I said on Twitter earlier. Um, get on those headphones, get yourself comfortable, pour yourself something delicious and enjoy 35 voices from right across the community around the world talking about the things we think or we would talk about if we would just hang out in a bar because we miss you. I miss you. You know I miss you. I, uh, I regularly tweet. Have I told you recently that I miss you? Have I told you lately that I miss you? And I do miss you all. You know, someone, quirky, someone who has spent the last couple of years before lockdown traveling the globe, you know, with rarely a weekend at home, it was a bit of a challenge um, to be stuck in here for the last 15 months now. Um, yeah, haven't left here for 15 months. And um, yeah, the last time I saw Sam in real life, was seven, it was the 13th of March last year. So uh, this is our second World <laughs> world Whiskey Summit. Uh, we held a pretty um, chaotic World Whiskey Summit last year. We tried to do something a little bit different this year because we realised that there's lots of other things going on now as things are starting to open up. And there's a football match on or something, which should be just about finishing in about five minutes. So... Oh, what are we going to do? Well, we've got lots of things to talk about. And let me tell you a little bit about Boutique Whiskey, if you don't already know. Um, we are an independent bottler. Um, we bottle great, great Scotch whiskies, but it's not all about Scotch. It's about whiskey, a world whiskey, whiskey from right around the world. Right from the beginning, we realised that there was great whiskey all around the world. And we've gone on to bottle whiskey from right around the world. In fact, our last series release was all non-Scotch whiskies. 
fact, a whole series dedicated to just one country. Once upon a time, they were the fourth largest whiskey producer in the world. Can you believe that? Yeah, Australian whiskey. And I don't know where Sam is, and I don't know what's going on, because I have no controls on all of these little videos. Going, but uh, happy world whiskey. Well, Dave, I fixed the problem, and you perfectly set up the fact that the whole world is... If you had asked anyone who was working in the Scotch whisky industry when I joined, which is about 30 years ago, what, what the landscape would look like in 2020 and 2021, I cannot imagine that anyone would have painted you a picture that looks anything like the situation we have today. Whisky has never been as exciting as it is right now. Everywhere that people drink whisky, they're now producing whisky, which is probably one of the best developments in a long time, you know, for the whiskey industry. It's the most exciting time, you know, to drink any distilled beverages made from grains. When I started uh, uh, a little over 20 years ago, there were a couple dozen distilleries across the country, and now there are, there are over 3,000, maybe more. It's so amazing to see the actual terroir of whiskey expanding and really becoming you know, country focused or regionally focused or even you know, in Australia it can be state focused even more so. Whiskey history has had a really interesting um, cycle of 30 to 40 years of going, going high and going low. Right now we're um, what seems to be the highest peak ever and it doesn't seem to have a opportunity to go down. Of course it will someday but right now we are enjoying so many privileges around the world both exploring new types of grain, exploring new barrel finishes, but also new primary barrel aging um, facets and abilities. I really think that whiskey's day has come in the way that beer's day came about 20 years ago. Brewers suddenly got to break out of the historic mold and become innovative brewers. And that's what's happening in whiskey right now is that we have left becoming just historic um, uh, artisans of old skill distilleries products and are now moving towards interpretations and modern expressions with everything on the table. And now the news. We'll do the year in review, but first, if you're watching this on a mobile, you're making a big mistake. Stick on headphones at least. But share it with friends, beam it to your smart TV, get it on YouTube on something that you can sit back, watch, pour yourself something special and be comfortable because today is World Whiskey Day. But what a year it's been, Dave. And what a year it has been indeed. And a lot has happened in these last 12 months, despite us being locked down for most of the world has been locked down. Um, art artist Emily Chappell, for example, has brought 23 brand new labels to life for our latest releases over the last 12 months. And back in May, just days after the last World Whiskey Summit, Ireland's Waterford Distillery unveiled its first commercial whiskey release since it went into production in January 2016. We've seen inaugural releases from new Scottish distilleries. And are you going to pick me up on my pronunciation here? Nick Neon, Tora Vague, Ardna Merkin, and Isla Rassi. Meanwhile, in October, Johanny Wahalker celebrated its 200th anniversary, and our friend Dr. Nick Morgan. <laughs> published the story of the world's number one whiskey book called The Long Drive. <laughs> ah, the first ever English whiskey festival happened in September, an event uh, really celebrating the growth and diversity of English whiskey. In the most recent update to the English whiskey map, you can find that third edition on the Cooper King uh, distillery blog. There are currently 33 distilleries in England. Also in October. Suntory announced their World Whiskey Owl. Uh, it was a blend of whiskeys from five countries. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the, the Wolf Strength, rather naughty, <laughs> announcing that it was the first ever world blended whiskey, a blend of Scottish, Japanese, Irish, Canadian, and American whiskeys. We also do a World Whiskey blend. That wasn't the first either. 
we know who's oh, the first. That coming up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in January, English whiskey distillery Henstone, still in England, listed their inaugural release, which sold out within hours. And in March, the folks behind London's Bimber Distillery unveiled their plans to open a new distillery in Speyside, so there'll be even more Bimbers on the secondary market. Uh, Bimber in England, Bimber in Scotland. Who would be an English or a Scottish dude? Oh, okay. Also in March, this is good news. Um, President Joe Biden suspended that 25% tariff on Scotch whiskey imposed by Trump in that long running row over Airbus and Boeing. And more recently, whiskey writer and friend of ours, Dominic Rosgrow, brought out a new free online whiskey magazine called Stills Crazy. They'll be focusing on world whiskey. Yeah, that first edition is available now. You can download this. It features our Boutique uh, Australia series, so definitely go and have a look at that, as well as some interesting articles from the Netherlands, from India, from Wales, and a chat to Irish distiller Peter Mulryan. The Oxford Artisan Distillery, or Toad, a new small English micro distillery, recently unveiled its inaugural whiskey release. Not the expected first single malt from them, though. No, it was a English rye whiskey. And over across the channel in France, Le Bourse Distillerie uh, became the 55th French distillery, bringing a whiskey that was brewed, fermented, distilled, and aged in France to market. And congratulations to serial entrepreneurs Thomas, <laughs> Thomas Ask and Tristan Stevenson, who secured 75,000 from three of the dragons on BBC program Dragons Den for their pouch subscription club whiskey me congratulations guys yeah, congratulations congratulations um and, and finally the official whiskey glass makers glencane crystal celebrates their 40 years of being around so happy birthday glencane happy birthday glencairn well that's been fun thanks for being here with us i have been dr whiskey and i've been boutique dave have good a night. great world whiskey day good night Good evening. Welcome to White Guys with Beards. I um, I come from a long line of white guys with beards. I think my father was the first. We all think our fathers were the first. That's part of what being a white guy is all about. <laughs> I'd like to bring in other friends with beards. Blair Bowman and Jan Groff. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Oh, you um, I've lost, I've lost, I've lost the script. I've lost the script. My mouse well, then I'll just take it from here. Guys, it's really <laughs> nice to see you. Thanks a lot for taking the time to do this. I'm sorry about the small tech hiccup right off the top, but it's, we seem to have recovered. Um, Blair, this is World Whiskey Day. Why is that so special to you? Well, it's the 10th time people have said today is World Whiskey Day. Um, and it's, yeah, I guess it is special and it's surreal in a, in a sense because it, all this stuff's happening all around the world simultaneously starting off in new zealand right the way through all the different time zones and this is the 10th time we've done that so yeah it's incredibly special so thank you for for putting this on again it's been a nice way to kind of connect during these strange times well thank you for continuing the white guy with beards tradition of claiming inventions as their own when you invented world whiskey day yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> And Jan, World Whiskey Forum. Tell us about that. Well, well how many minutes do I have? Uh, half an hour, two hours? Uh, well, the World Whiskey Forum, as um, the idea came from, from as, as you mentioned, the idea of taking the whiskey out of, out of Scotland. Um, I've been working in the Scottish industry for at least 20 years, and I recognize that more and more countries around the globe actually both producing and drinking whiskey. And uh, my idea was to gathering together and uh, have a chat about, especially for the industry guys, uh, to have a chat about both sharing experience, have a chat about the future and what we can help each other with, uh, helping people to understand more about both production, production and for drinking. 
So when you started it, or Blair, even 10 years ago, was it mostly Scotland or was what did we already see uh, world whiskey becoming what we what we see today? I mean, about 10 years ago, things were very different, as you kind of alluded to in the start. And, you know, it was probably just before Boutique started. You know, so whiskey's come a long way. You know, 10 years ago, the thought of having a brand that could do the great, fun, quirky, zany, brilliant stuff that you guys are doing would have just been unheard of, you know. And it's great, you know, that there now is a space to have a brand like Boutique that can just have fun with whiskey and just like exactly what you guys have been doing with Uncorked Sessions, just bringing a bit of fun and getting not too precious about whiskey. Like I think it was 10 years ago. I think that unpreciousness has been unraveled and people are having fun with, you know, this is orange soda and whiskey. It's great. It's tasty. Why would I not drink it? Because it's tasty. Exactly. <laughs> it does look, deli look delicious. No, I totally agree with that. I mean, what few years it was very serious to drink whiskey it's a very uh, most complicated drink you can ever have and then suddenly uh, you guys came along and, and and i too understand that i mean it's, it's been drinking it for fun and it's supposed to be fun uh, so yeah definitely agree well we, we you're right we do have a lot of fun planned tonight uh, blair you're all over the world on world whiskey day since you found it 10 years ago where are you going for the rest of today uh, where am I going the rest of the day? I, I've definitely got stuff lined up later in the US. I've been in India and Asia already. Um, so yeah, lots of interesting stuff lined up, but I can do it all from this seat without having to move anywhere. So there's a benefit to that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> traveling well. Are, are, are you drinking the same drink all the time? Uh, no, I've got different drinks lined up. I, as you might be able to see, there's a whole kind of selection of samples <laughs> here. Uh, this is my kind of day job work here actually, but I'm probably gonna work through them anyway. And Jan, the next World Whiskey Forum, obviously last year was a bit different because all the challenges. Where, where are we going to gather next year? Uh, this year, actually, in September, we're gathering Excuse together me, yeah. in, in Denmark. So we're meeting up each other uh, in, in Stowning Distillery. Uh, amazing st distillery, amazing people, um, most of hospitality. Uh, so we were looking forward to that, actually. Um, last time we were in Seattle and Westward, it was fantastic. Westland Distillery is uh, um, totally a new experience for me, especially... I have the opportunity to meet the guys out in Skadik Valley and uh, knowing more about the cereals and what they are doing up there. It was amazing, amazing, really, really good. It's super was delicious. Just before lockdown, was the timing of the Seattle... Yeah, we just, we just missed the lockdown with a couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Actually ended up the, the, the World Whiskey Forum in Westland just a few weeks before the lockdown. Yeah, amazing. So we it tried to schedule our World Whiskey Forum all this, all this become, become, because of the pandemics. Well, from Eight Box months. Distillery to Westland and now to Stowning, whiskey yeah, really is global. Had stop, we had to stop in Cotswolds first because we talked about the English whiskey before. So we had to stop in Cotswolds. So, oh, yeah. Cool. And, and uh, of course, the future for us is um, very much what you're doing, where we would like to take the, the forum to Asia. And uh, and I, I have in my 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 crystal ball uh, South America, uh, South Africa. I mean, there's whiskey produced everywhere. And I think we definitely need to, to learn from each other. Amen. So let's keep the conversation going. Let's hear from voices around the world. Guys, thanks so much for being here. Enjoy your World Whiskey thanks Day. For having me. Well, and cheers. Cheers. And, cheers. and cheers. all the other ways. But um, let's cool. hear from voices around the world about the fact that the, 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 the bee of whiskey is pollinating truly around the world right now. We've never had so much choice of whiskey and it's a really exciting time to be a whiskey lover. Uh, probably the most exciting time to be a whiskey lover. It doesn't matter what your flavour preference is with whiskey, there is now something for everybody. Previously on the Million Dollar Nose. It is always a great honour for me every year to be part of the judging panel of the International Spirits Challenge and at the International Wine Spirit Competition because it gives me personally the rare opportunity to view all spirits. And when we're talking about spirits, we're talking about not only Scotch whiskey, we're talking about Irish whiskey, Japanese whiskey, and American whiskey. But what it does allow you to see, perhaps for the first time, the changes that are going on in the world. The amateur whiskey student is also really interested in trying these new ways of distilling 
because it teaches them something about what they already understood. Times are so different. People come into the bar, they kind of know what they want. Whereas in the past, you, every little thing you got to push, you know? You know, I think there's a lot of, of reframing for ourselves, what we're expecting from whiskeys. And I think people are also more adventurous. I mean, I find, especially with running the club, I run a whiskey club in New York, um, everybody's been interested in new flavors. So like everybody started with something. They started with bourbon or they started with Irish or started with scotch. Now it's what else can I taste? They've had years of drinking one or all of those. So now every new thing that comes out, whether it's American single malt, whether it's Kavalon, whether it's some of the Japanese releases they're interested in, you know, there's um, milk and honey in Israel. They're kind of like, hey, let's see what that tastes like. And I think people are a lot more open. Whiskey fans are brand and category promiscuous. <gasps> and I think I definitely fall within that bracket as well. I've got whiskey staring at my shelves behind the camera here. You know, I've got all stuff from all over Scotland. Uh, I've got Germany Ooh. over here, all over America, from East Coast, uh, Canadian, uh, Japan, Taiwanese, uh, New Zealand, uh, Swedish. Taking malt whiskey and trying to turn it into something unusual, different, um, put their own spin and signature on it, put their own stamp on it, and take it in ways that Scotch doesn't go and, and find a new way. And, and to be honest, that's... As somebody who writes and, and covers and drinks whiskey, um, that's one of the best developments that has happened and, and has led to an incredible amount of innovation. It's amazing that people can actually just go, let's just do it and try it. And at, at the end of the day, if it doesn't work out, they're not known for making that anyway, because they're still new. So they can just move on and try something else. It's amazing to see what happens locally, perhaps in the countries that we both we both live in. I mean, I live in the Netherlands now and, you know, we're really focused on, you know, making Geneva and different spirits and fruit spirits here. But there there is a huge abundance of grains making its way into into sort of heritage and terroir driven distillates here in northern Europe. But even just just thinking beyond that, the rise of rye is also really exciting. If we look at, you know, almost the world of, uh, I suppose, new world whiskey, whether it's regions outside of, you know, the top whiskey making regions of the world, like, you know, uh, Scotland, Canada, US or Japan, just seeing, you know, the far reaches of even New Zealand, Australia, Denmark, Finland, just so many cool things happening. Corn whiskeys being produced in Mexico. Just, I, I think it's, you know, we're, we're so focused on heirloom grains anyway and how we bring that into our, our food and beverage scene, but seeing that make its way into uh, the world of whiskey and really be taken seriously as a, a, a super craft and just really beautiful expression of, of the land and technique is, is quite astonishing. Yeah, I guess I've been lucky enough to travel the world a little bit and seen a little bit of the changes that have happened in um, the industry over in the US and um, down in Mexico, and um, just following on again from Chris's point from um, this cross-pollination, um, when I was down there, I saw some um, interesting sort of takes, and that was like speaking to a few people as to why they weren't producing bourbons, because I've got so many interesting types of corn um, down in Mexico. Um, and so now in the next couple of years, actually, there'll be a, a couple of really cool bourbons made from like not this monoculture corn that's made in the US, but you get these different you know, the black corns and all these other corns that are, are brilliant. You know, we're, we're all in kind of such small, tight-knit communities and you get really locked into like, this is the most important thing about whiskey or this is what defines the flavor. This is where it all comes from. And you start to accept that as like a dogma. And you're like, well, of course it's true, right? Because everyone around me believes it and their whiskey is really good. And then you go to another group and they're like, this is the most important thing about whiskey. And they're completely unrelated. And they're both equally convinced that it's 100% true. And, you know, part of what I realized is actually um, none of us really knows what we're doing really at all. <laughs> and, that's, and we all have a lot that we could learn from each other. You don't know uh, as a society all that much about spirits. We drink, you know, we drink what, you know, we see other people drink. We drink, you know, what our boss drinks. We drink what our, you know, parents drank or our in-laws drank. Do we like that? Not necessarily, but we don't know what else to drink. And we're worried that the bartender, the, the, the salesperson, the, you know, the server, you know, our friends are going to say, well, why did you order that? You should.
should drink this. Everyone is drinking this. Introducing this whiskey. Probably the best way to get is like language. You know, how language has changed from its root source to what it is today in different countries. It's what whiskey has done now, which is fantastic. It's the sharing and passing on of knowledge. Shouldn't you be trying to, to challenge these maybe stereotypes or even just rules? You know, why are you, why are you filling a cask at 63.5% just because a distillery says that's what they do in Scotland? Just seeing the different perspectives, you know, what's important, what they measure, you know, how they judge success or not. Um, it's so different. And it's I'm grateful for those kind of extra tools and also a little bit of just that, like, ability to break out of the dogma of one group. They are they're looking at every single detail. So, you know, they're not just saying, OK, I'm going to use that standard use because that's what the industry in Scotland's been doing for thousands and of, hundreds of years or whatever. You know, they're saying, actually, I want to look at where my grain comes from. I want to look at, you know, what yeast I'm going to use because I don't have a history that dictates to me a, a, or an existing culture. You know, that, that's where they can be so innovative. There are certain principles under which you want to try to function that you know are working. But that doesn't mean that you have to do everything by a recipe out of a cookbook. We've been... Uh, very fortunate at having the luxury of, of distilling textbooks and, and stories that have been passed around, maybe not only in the last sort of 10, 15 years, but going back to even the early 90s, um, these these kind of uh, traits and, and, and ways of production just, just weren't really understood. We don't have a lot of rules and regulations and restrictions of how to make whiskey. All we have to do is stick it into oak for two two years and that's it. So we can play around with grain, we can play around with sizes, we can play around with yeast and all sorts of different production processes. And this is happening in, you know, a lot of different countries as well. People are making their own rules and what we can see is just such a, a great innovation of whiskey that's going to be happening for the next couple of years. And for a long, long time, everyone was like, all about casks. All of the flavour comes from casks, don't worry about anything else. Now people have realised there's a, there's a lot of things you can do to make your whiskey different, right? I'm a big fan of tasting the grains. I actually find it overpowering and almost too rich when it has so much oak maturation on it. It it becomes all about the oak rather than the grain. And I maybe I'm like that with, with flour as well. Like I prefer, you know, a croissant or like a loaf of bread to to like a chocolatey dessert that has a remnant of flour in it. I um uh so I, I often get hooked into something like Lagavulin like eight. When that came out, I was so excited because it was the perfect amount of, of peat, which I love, but you could really taste the grain and even the, the color was lighter, just everything about it. Just It just tasted like the earth. It tasted like the grain, and I love that. Hello. Welcome to the Whiskey Weather Report, looking ahead to the 2020s. It's been a slow start this decade, with numerous isolated pockets of virtual drowning, followed by outbreaks of online conspiracy theory and idiots. But as we look ahead through the early part of the decade, we can see things starting to open up, with a sweaty front of festivals developing across the globe. Later on, to a build-up of extreme seshing and high prevalence of white men with beards hugging and saying, I love you, you're my best friend. We're also starting to see some breaks in this dark and pervasive cloud of commercial distilling yeast that's been with us for the past several decades. Brighter spots of brewing and experimental yeast varieties are beginning to shine through, and we should start to see these develop nicely over the course of the coming decade. There should be some unusual fruitiness later on, with patchy formations of fashionable bacteria and esters, while the influence of Hamden will also continue to move in from the Caribbean. Looking across to Ireland, we can see some upsurging of unlikely and unpredictable wood types, including bog oak, old IRA ammunition boxes, and plywood, while those outbreaks of passive-aggressive tweeting from Mark Rainier we've been seeing are only likely to intensify over the next few years. Occasional outbreaks of Fabergé eggs are also to be expected. As ever, we're seeing a large accumulation of opinion, which is bringing with it a lot of hot air and a build-up of pressure in the secondary market. But we should start to see some bubbles bursting soon, so be sure to bring a brolly, 
and don't be surprised if we see some shitstorms in the medium term. Meanwhile, a red weather alert remains in place throughout the entire decade for investment gurus and charlatans. Looking further afield to America, we can see these unpredictable cyclones of tariffs, newly permitted 70cl bottles, and laws around cask use are all starting to create uncertain patterns for scotch. While American whiskey looks typically unpredictable, due to the fact Americans are plainly mental. Our advice? Wear a Glencairn lanyard at all times. Closer to home, and Edinburgh is starting to see vertical distilling coming in from the north, with outbreaks of horizontal, perpendicular and subterranean distilling to follow. While tourism for now remains intermittent, leading to transparent manipulation of the secondary market, followed by ironic sale of bulk filling contracts by certain distilleries. The pricing outlook remains stubbornly high, with an amber warning for flippers in place throughout much of the decade. And there's a pervasive front of hipsters moving in from the southwest, expected to clash later on with Instagram influencers, creating hazardous conditions for the will to live. Finally, if you're in Scotland, you might want to be prepared for sudden outbreaks of salmon jokes, with abnormal build-up around the Drumna Drocket area, and everyone should anticipate the likelihood of dogging on Sky, Isla, Orkney and Mull. And that's the weather. During these early years, in the 60s, particularly the 60s, there was a sort of veil of secrecy about, you know, a blender could not speak to another blender in another company, that this did not happen. And even uh, very much so that a female could not come into the sample room. She was completely and utterly barred from that. So this veil of secrecy was something I didn't particularly like because even when I got in touch with the Distillers Company Limited uh, in the 60s, 1968 to be precise, and looking for new spirit samples, I was pertinently told, I'm sorry, you're not on. You don't, we don't give these kind of samples out and hung up immediately on it. Even when making American whiskey and referring to you know, technical manuals and technical information that was generated by the Scotch whiskey industry. And I you know, think that's a, that's a big opportunity for us. I think more and more people in the States are kind of realizing that um, we should start to embrace some of that rigor and like data sharing. Yes, we've, we've used Scotch as a sort of diving board to, to start off. But I think in the last you know, five, 10 years, Australia really has come into its own of what it wants to produce. We've learned the basics from the, the Scotch industry and now we're changing it because certain things don't work. A lot of the energy that's come into distilling uh, over the past 15 or 20 years has actually come from the United States. I mean, you know, obviously there were some new distilleries set up in Scotland. Kilcoman is a great, great example of something that's been hugely successful. But I think that idea that almost anyone could have a go, that anyone could have a go, and that they could try and base their, their distilling and, if you like, their, their marketing uh, stuff around the locality and, you know, sourcing local grains and all of this sort of stuff, it seems to me that's where this spark of energy came from. And I was lucky enough to hear some people talk at com different conferences uh, around the world. And, you know, even even probably in the early 2000s, we were looking at them going, these guys are absolutely nuts. You know, this will never this will never happen around the world. But of course it did. America tends to have um, leadership in certain concepts and ideas. The one thing Americans do have, though, is give me a box and I'm going to find a way to make that work. And I'm going to push the edges of that box as far as I can. So... If you want to, if you want to spur create creativity, say here are the rules, and this is all you can work with. I always joke that the Australian spirit is within an Australian spirit because it shows passion and it shows authenticity, and just giving it a red hot go. And it might not always work out, but we'll figure it out in the end. That's our magic sauce. As more people do that, and as more people deliver that experience to customers, I think it will be a, a rising tied for all of us. I think we can definitely look at the idea of a rising tide sails all ships at the moment when it comes to global whiskey. Um, what's happening within Australia, Sydney, um, Finland, the US, Canada, like above and beyond, it's amazing. 
And I think what's really exciting for me personally, one category that I've got my eye on is actually Irish whiskey. I think the renaissance of Irish whiskey is really, really exciting to watch and sort of taste and follow along with. Always be nice, you know, um, even if it is maybe not your particular cup of tea or, or glass of whiskey, uh, pardon the pun, it's um, it's going to be someone else's. And and yet, yeah, yeah there, was, there was a huge amount of this this, this, this bashing, you know, our oh, Scotland's, you know, what do they know? Um, we're so innovative in our last 25 years, blah, 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 blah. And, and really, you know, when you go to the distilleries and they're saying, oh, you know, we've, we've copied this um, off the Scots and we've copied this off the Irish. And I, I kind of felt like sticking up my hand and saying, well, no, 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 not really. You've, you, you're scratching the surface, but you're, you're not, you're not breaking the mold by any extent. The whiskies you're going to see, the spirits you're going to see, maybe that just that little bit immature, a bit, bit raw. This is going to be controversial, but do we need craft? Everyone, people, you know, the expertise and the aficionados, they kind of look down on mass brands, but there's a reason why Maker's Mark is a humongous successful brand. It's a really good whiskey. There's a reason why Old Grandad is, or Four Roses, are very, very, very successful brands. They are delicious. And I'm not sure that you're going to convince me to buy something just for the exoticism factor. both exciting and not at the same time. Um, you know, yeah, I, I've yeah. had many, you know, uh, American malts here that I've loved and I've been so impressed by. And then I've had some that I'm like, you know, honestly, we'll see how long this goes for and, and you know, where it goes. And, uh, but uh, I think that's just kind of part of it. It's, you know, the ones that, you know, are good enough to make it will and the ones that don't, don't. Because craft, is not what these guys, some of these guys are doing. They might be in a shed and they might feel all the criteria of small production, but actually what they're making is trash. I mean, it's rubbish. When do we stop encouraging bad whiskey? Bad whiskey is raw chicken. You know, you might like Kentucky Fried, I might like roast, but raw chicken is raw chicken. And neither of us can eat that. I mean, we did have the three-year-old Cotswolds on the table in Denmark, and everyone wanted to try it. Um, nice. The, and yeah, they did. They were they wanted to try it. They want. They, they, oh, I've never had an English whiskey before, so let's let's go for it. Cool. Um, yeah, they were, the right they, they, they were really up for trying new stuff. Yeah, I, don't, yeah, I, don't, I, I think things have changed fundamentally recently. You know, it, it's you know, it very it was the case. You know, it was. You know, uh, oh my goodness, it's an English whiskey. You know, are, are they even allowed to make whiskey? You know, yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, you know, I bet or not. I don't think I'll bother trying it. I know. I, I think everybody knows that whiskey is being made and good whiskey is being made all around the world, and that kind of prejudice is, is disappearing and disappearing fast. I think we are in a golden age of distillation. I think 
there's much wider thinking. I think people's minds are open in terms of flavor, in terms of mixability, in terms of versatility, in terms of relating whiskey to the wider world rather than little kind of silos thinking about, you know, these are the only people who can drink whiskey and this is the only time you can drink whiskey. I'm not sure that everyone who drinks whiskey is open-minded. I think they should be. I believe if you're going to be a whiskey aficionado, and I think this is really speaking to, mo to most of the aficionados out there, you need to be willing to open your mind and your palate to what is out there because the level of flavor that you will miss out on if you keep a narrow perspective is immense. And who's got time to miss out on all of this deliciousness? They're not driving a train that's been going in one direction for a long time, that has a committed set of fans who, um, who, who will shout loudly if there is change. You know, how many whiskey fans does it take to change a light bulb? Change? Um, <laughs> Speaking of change, I need a drink. Dave, welcome back. Uh, hi. Well, it's uh, yeah, white guys with beards. Here we are. That's good to see some uh, some faces there. Jackie Summers, absolutely superb. And that that quote from uh, Dominic with his raw chicken just makes me laugh every bloody time. I know he'll be bloody delighted right now because his football team has just won a cup or something. I don't think it's a Glen can full of whiskey, but it's, it's a cup and he'll be very, very happy. So what have we got in our whiskey packs this evening? Well, we chose it. We, we, we thought fairly long and hard. No, we didn't. We did. We did. We did think long and hard about what whiskeys we were going to have tonight. And we thought we'd start with the World Whiskey Blend. Well, I thought I'd start with the World Whiskey Blend. Well, we picked a few other ones. So we've got Taguchi from Japan, a Japanese whiskey. Or it was, or is it? Um, no, it's not. It's a sourced whiskey. The malt comes from Scotland. The grain comes from Canada. Uh, it's blended and matured in, uh, in, in, in Japan, actually in a, an abandoned railway tunnel outside of Tokyo. Uh, obviously in casks before they put it in the railway tunnel. It's not just one big railway tunnel full of whiskey <laughs> with a tap on the other end. That would be cool. That would be something to say, wouldn't it? So wait, in um, three years, this won't be Japanese whiskey. This will be so that makes it very collectible, or what? <laughs> it makes it very drinkable. Um, Scotch and Canadian whiskey blended together. Yeah, why not? Um, we picked an uncle nearest, um, and I thought we should pick a, an uncle nearest. Um, the story of nearest green is well worth watching. Head over to the nearest uh, uncle nearest website. There's a great introduction with the story. It's a little movie there you can watch. Uh, the first known. African-American master distiller uh, in Tennessee, in the hills, just above Lynchburg, he learned to distill. And it, it is him who is said to have brought this uh, charcoal filtration that, that's now called, was called leaching and now called the Lincoln County, County process. So we've got some right. uncle near us. Um, yeah, well worth watching. Um, we've brought some Millstone because we love Patrick Van Zidane. Um, and this is a single cask, not a boutique one. This is a six-year-old single cask. Um, and it, it will be delicious. And, of course, we had to have some of our Australian um, whiskey. We chucked in a dram of Riverborn, um, one of our recent Australian series, distilled by Australia's oldest distiller. I wonder if he likes being called Australia's oldest distiller. Um, um, cause everyone's not catching him up, really, are they? Martin Pye, uh, a third-generation pharmacist who has a, has a fascination with mathematics, chemistry, and all of the other good stuff. Um, and this is a cracking three-year-old. So they're the whiskeys that we've got, Sam, tonight. Whatever you're drinking at home, I hope it's something worldly. I hope you're sat back comfortably enjoying this, not sitting on your phone awkwardly. Put on headphones if you're on your phone, at least. Come on. But really, beam it to a television. Get it on a big screen. Uh, our colleague, John Minter, has spent weeks making this look beautiful. Uh, we've got voices from all over the world that we've already heard from and that are still coming up. And then we've got more from White Guys with Beards in just a few moments. The biggest change, more than anything, uh, was in 1997, on the 23rd of November 1997 in Frankfurt, 
when Christian Rosenberg started the first ever whiskey festival. And that was for whiskies around the world, but mainly, once again, for blended whiskies. Yes, the malts were starting to rise slowly but surely, along with the small batch bourbons, but they were certainly in their infancy. And again, we talk about the same things. There was no Wikipedia, there was no internet, there was no bloggers. These things were just rumbling in the background. And then, of course, when we started the whiskey festivals, the blenders, the distillers, uh, the producers came to uh, Germany. Then we went to New York one year later, and then everything started to blossom. But what we did find about more than anything is that when the uh, participants and the guests arrived at these whiskey festivals, they were looking for something different. They weren't just looking for blended whiskies, they were looking for single malts, and we had to curate and create different styles of whiskies. And then, of course, it blossomed very much after that. The situation in Japan changed a lot since Masataka Taketsuru been to Scotland. But in, it was in 2008 when I was working at the hotel as a barman. Everybody, like consumers, believed that whiskey is only two kinds. Then I a little bit exaggerated, but uh, everybody thinking that whiskey equals scotch whiskey or bourbon, American. That's it. Nothing else. When the Japanese whiskey boom happened, people were happy to spend a little bit more cash, you know, um, drinking more premium stuff or collecting more premium stuff. Then came along Sullivan Cove winning that big award as well. And uh, man, look at our prices of Aussie whiskey. <laughs> I would say 98% of our customers, you know, we lead them and we, we try to guide them using flavor profiles. The kinds of people who enjoy drinking whiskey are probably the most curious on the planet. They enjoy flavour and they enjoy understanding how flavour is created. So with the whiskey category, category becoming so much bigger, uh, they're really looking outside of their own comfort zones and being tempted by whiskey from maybe regions they never would have looked at before. And it's all in that, that drive to uh, discover new flavours and new experiences in the whiskies they're drinking. When we do it by flavor profile, it's so much easier. And you know, when we when we open up a bottle to let the customer smell it, we're like, you know, it's kind of like they'll they'll be like, what 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 is this whiskey? Where is it from? It's like, no, it doesn't matter. Just have a smell. Do you like it? That's more important because it doesn't matter where it comes from. You play with woods. You can play with different things. The way you process barley or the way you process corn or whatever. You, you, you do all that and people are absolutely willing to try, but then when it actually comes down to what then continues to sell through and what, what the consistent pickup is from a consumer standpoint, it ends up still, it's not right there in the core, but it goes whoop, and then it comes back to closer as things start to move off the shelf. Because I think people do experiment, but I think just innately come back to something they're comfortable with. If you're trying one of these new world whiskies, you're expecting it to be different. You're expecting it to be new. And you're expecting them to talk about a new place or a new grain or a new yeast or a weird still or something different. Coming from a time and, and starting this industry where people were so hard nosed on, they only like this brand of this thing. And if you didn't have that, they almost would like not have anything. Uh, and it was a, a really hard uh, change to get people to try something new. Whereas now uh, there's not enough new for them to try. Here's my point. You're gonna vote with your wallet and your taste buds. At the end of the day, that's what you. That's what everything boils down to. And, and everybody goes, oh, that's a very oversimplification of that. I go, yeah, but it's true. Whiskey's not cheap. So the problem is, is that you have to convince a consumer to pay more for something that doesn't fall into what they normally drink, maybe taste different. And it's like, so I give people an example of like American craft whiskey. And you have to convince somebody that they should buy a American craft release over buying Russell Reserve 10-year-old for 40 bucks. And they know what, what Russell Reserve is. It's at a fixed price point. It's made by a guy with, whore, you know, m as much experience that had life on this planet. Um, why shouldn't I go that way? And part of it is tasting. Like, not every place um, has a robust tasting regime. 
a lot of times you're buying stuff blind because, you know, the bottles aren't open in the store. So if you don't get that chance, and that's what I use the, you know, the club for, is people get to taste it. If they've tasted it and get to talk to the, the, the manufacturer, talk to the distiller, whatever, and have a better understanding of what it is and, like, what its place is in the whiskey firmament, it's easier for them to go in their pocket and pull out stuff, pull out their wallet. We passed uh, now, I think it's pretty much 48 states allow tastings like they do for wine tastings. So you can go into the place where you're buying your spirits, a liquor store, and sample the product. And the, why is that important? Because if you're going to, if you're going to, you and I both know the difference between the $25 bottle and the $50 bottle is, is, is real. But for a consumer who's just starting to try whiskey, uh, you have to let them try it. You know, they have to taste it before they'll buy it. Brett and I are the guys who actually deal with the end consumer. And something's not sold until they come back and buy another bottle. And a lot of us lose sort of sight on that. But, the, you know, and that's, that's our, our, our main job. A good retailer, a good retailer is about education. If we're educating, the other thing that most people don't understand is that the whiskey that is in their bottle did not come from a single cask. It came from a bunch of casks, and that's news to them. So really, all we need to do is just to be, again, transparent and open, honest, educate how whiskey is made. The new consumer can really embrace this new world of whiskey through being guided by flavor and being guided by recommendation from bartenders and being guided by occasion. I love bourbon and I love scotch, but bourbon tastes like bourbon. No matter what you do to it, it still tastes like bourbon, you know? And scotch, again, no matter what you do to it, it's like, oh, yeah, that's a scotch. Now, of course, the Japanese is now um, kind of very similar. What's fun about new small distilleries is they're brand new flavors. They're flavors that we've never tasted before. And it's not like it tastes like a traditional product. It tastes like something we've never had. Life is short. Drink fucking whiskey. Drink all of it. Find out what you like, sure. You might be a Lafroy person. You might be a, you know, Ibiki per Like, whatever you like, go drink that shit. Life is short. Drink whiskey. With and welcome back to the white guys with beard show um i know i know you're all desperate for some barley news you've been right i've seen it in the comments you've been when are we going to be start talking about barley uh because last year you know we had the international barley hub in telling us lots of stories um i have read the scotch whiskey cereals technical note the fifth edition identifying the recommended spring barleys for 2021 harvest um it looks like the reign of concerto is finally over introduced back in 2009 at its height accounted for more than 50 percent of all the malting barley purchased in the uk mainly due to its lack of alternatives in the early 2010s now, while Concerto still sits on that 2021 approved list, last year, Laureate had the greatest market share. Two new barley strains have provisional approval for the 2021 harvest this year, Tungsten and Firefox. So that's something we'll be hearing about in, I guess, three years' time, four years' time. <laughs> Just hearing the way you talk about that, Dave, they're like market leaders. It's an agricultural product treated like something to be marketed. I'd love to bring in some guests about this. Do we need more white guys with beards? Of course we do. Well, of course. <laughs> Let's Howdy, y'all. Gentlemen. Young. Greetings. Evening. Evening. Billy, Jason, and Jason, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for maintaining your beard, Jason. You're welcome. Billy, and the other Jason, well... I'm impressed nonetheless. Hi. <laughs> Guys, I'd like you straight from the whiskey protection program. Yeah, yes. 
Did you hear what Dave just said about grains and concerto? And we've spoken about this, I think, a few of us before, about the, the dominance of certain types of grains in specifically Scotch whiskey. We're now getting that really exposed by the world using different grains and saying, why are we so strange in what we use in, in, in some of the more traditional uh, distilleries, whether it's America or Scotland or Canada, even GMO ingredients, uh, really quite boring corns and things like this. What's the deal? Uh, I spoke to John Letts from Toad from Oxford uh, artisan distiller and I thought we'd see a little bit from him to sort of show the other side of like what Dave was talking about. Hello my name is John Letts. I'm a, a farmer, an organic farmer, an archaeobotanist. I always call myself um, and a, a plant breeder based in the UK and I coordinate the grain that's being used for the Oxford Artisan Distillery to make a very fine whiskey which has just been launched. So basically I have a system where my mantra is in diversity there is strength we're clearly in a period of extreme crisis the last few years we keep having droughts we're in the middle of a drought right now well thank god it rained yesterday because the cereal farmers were starting to get really worried in the uk that we're repeating last year well because these crop ancient crops these older crops have such deep root systems they can survive these crises and that's the whole prediction for climate change isn't it? it's unpredictability in extreme events well plant breeders have to think 10 years ahead well, modern varieties can't cope with that. You know, the number of times where I've had my field planted right next to a crop of modern cereal, modern wheat, and the drought comes, the modern wheat is brown, dead, the seeds are tiny. You can you can you can distill them and 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 draw whatever flavor you can come out of them, but they're inferior in my view. And my crops almost a meter and a half tall, green and thriving. And you know, the proof's in the pudding. What's what's horrible is that these crops are illegal. You know, I can't spread the seed out. That's what's strange. I couldn't give you that even if I wanted to because of the law is all supporting, uh, you know, the marketing of modern varieties. So it's insane. Even though this is a solution at every level, uh, in a, from sustainability, genetic diversity, pollinators, all of that, it is actually illegal to market these crops. The whole system is stacked against us, but yet that is the system that is supporting modern brewing and modern distilling and the modern flower industry. So we have a deep transformation we have to do. Fascinating. Yeah, serious stuff. Discuss, guys. White guys with beards, underrepresented voices. <laughs> <laughs> but there are very few of us. Uh, let, let, yeah, let me bring my uh, white man with beard expert opinion down upon you, Sam and Dave and assorted That's chat. how it's done from white guys with beards, isn't it? There's no other way to deliver opinion. <laughs> there's, there's a terrific book by Dan Barber called The Third Plate, and it was Matt Hoffman at Westland that, that turned me on to that. And it speaks to exactly what we just heard a moment ago is – it's one thing for the consumer to want to see change. It's another thing for the producer to want to implement change. Without politicians changing how the game is played, we're not going to see the changes that we desperately want to. And on one hand, that seems a little bit dispiriting, <laughs> no pun intended. On the other hand, professional, uh, on the other hand, <laughs> We, we, can, we can vote with our, our pound notes and our dollar bills and our yen, right? We, we do have some role to play in this as consumers. And consumer has been such a dirty word for so long that we might want to try and reclaim it. And we might want to say we are going to spend where our beliefs lie. And with that said, it's a new Westland that I've got in my glass. And so this is the new Calera. And so this is, this is from the Skagit Valley. Um, Jan was talking about the Skagit Valley way back in the beginning, uh, in the introduction. The Skagit Valley is doing wonderful things. The Washington State um, Bread Lab is out there. They're playing yeah. around with grains. Dan Barber's book includes that uh, group as well. And so this is Alba. How many whiskeys have we had using Alba barley? And it's tremendous. It's absolutely delicious. So there you go. I will understand there are other people to play here, and I will open the floor. Um, my thing always about this whole people talking about grain and all that sort of thing, 
is that there's not only one whiskey that people make. People make whiskey in different ways. And there's this big obsession currently with grain. There's a big obsession with oak before. There's a big obsession every year with yeast, but that never goes anywhere because yeast isn't sexy. So it's this ongoing thing where people saying now, oh, yeah, you have to pay attention to your grain. Lots of whiskey makers don't give a crap about grain. It's not where they make their flavor. They make their flavor elsewhere in the process. And having you know, people have always looked at grains in different ways. Some people want to amplify flavor. Some people want to just use grain as a source of some sugar, and then we'll do cool stuff later on. And I, I like the fact that we're actually finally talking about grain and people are getting out there and doing experiments. But it's the cycle. You know, they did this back in the day. They've already done this before. They just didn't necessarily have quite such excellent science going on to actually be able to write it all down. And mm -hmm. Yeah, but people often, and you know, some of the sort of things that popped up when the guys were talking and people when they talk about this in general, you get this whole, especially our, our great friend Mark Rainier, a man who uh, is never shy when it comes to sharing his opinion that what he's doing is entirely the best thing ever, and which I thoroughly support his his ability to do it. I may not ever agree with him, but at the same time, I'm very pleased he does it. Yep. Um, again, it's this whole thing. If he says this is the most important thing, it's like, well, to you, yeah, it is. Fair play. Good work. Keep up the good work. But yeah, um, and I'm really pleased people are looking into it. But yeah, don't think it's the only way. It is not the only way. There are many, many places we can play around making great flavors in whiskey. Yeah, it, Jason, if, before we give the floor to you, I just wanted to add on to what you're saying there, Billy, where for, for us in the United States, uh, and you know, here I am in Virginia, when we were first introduced to Westland and we went around pouring Westland for people, we were talking about a mixed... Um, a mixed <laughs> barley mash bill that meant something if you were into beer. And Jason Parker said it in one of his videos earlier with Copperworks here, where beer had this huge moment in the spotlight and they did a ton of educating uh, of the consumer. And the consumer started coming away talking about barley and Lovibon scale and flavor. Yeah. And distillers never really jumped on that. And when we first were introduced to Westland, they were one of the first distillers we met who were saying, yeah, we've taken some of that chocolate malt. Obviously, some of us remember chocolate malt from being in Signet through Glamorangy, right? But, but the sin against uh, chocolate malt is that it delivers flavor, but it doesn't deliver yield. And so how do you strike that balance? Hmm. And it's like, well, maybe flavor could be more important than yield if you could get consumers to pay more for a bottle of whiskey. But all of this is to say, when we went out and talked to whiskey consumers, but we drew in the beer grains, they were already listening. They were already on board. And flavor wasn't that hard a sell, even though I understand as a producer, yield can be a little bit tricky. So. Sorry, Jason. Well, I think it's a great point. We're, we're discussing it later. And Jason uh, Parker, who you mentioned, brings up this point of efficiency and when how do you balance being sustainable and ecological against deriving flavor from your grain? Jason, any thoughts before we go to a new topic? Uh, sure, yeah. Well, hang on. This thing is really giving me the willies. Um, so, um, <laughs> I, know, I know it's not it's real. A lie. I wouldn't have been invited if I hadn't changed my Facebook picture. Look, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'm slightly contrarian because I, I love the idea that that you know whiskey's all made with um, with the same kind of thing. And when I worked at the Soho Whiskey Club, I love that idea of standing in front of this wall of completely different things, which all use fundamentally the same ingredients. But mm. but as a as someone who does some home brewing, I, I really take your point about about those different roasting levels and so forth. So. Um, yeah and as billy said we get so many flavors from so many different sources it's um it's going to be interesting just to, to see if using different barley strains and different roasting levels and so on transfers all the way through the process in a way that's meaningful for us the uh, the whiskey fan because you know remember you know especially the larger the scale of the distillery they need to they need to get that consistency they can't just keep experimenting and, yeah. and doing things these things take years to to even get to a point where you can taste them um you know, we we don't want this to go totally in the craft beer direction where you have you have to drink a different thing every day. Um, yeah, I, it's a, it's it's an interesting point. That's not a conclusion, is it? Oh, take it away. <laughs> I'm just loving that it's the fake beer is becoming a classic underbeard from like the 1850s. <laughs> yeah. Fine wine, but it's not pool English. <laughs> well, yeah, we can I live in Mennonite country. I live I'm in sure Mennonite country. 
and Jason could be passing my house right now on a horse with a buggy behind it. You would you would fit right in here, my friend. On his live stream, yeah. I'd <laughs> like being standing, yes. <laughs> This is a topic area that's going to come up later in the show. We talk about sustainability, but for right now, I think a more pressing topic for all of us, we've spoken about it off air uh, and on other programs that we've all been on together during this lockdown period. And some of us have even written about it, diversity, inclusion, the changing uh, reality that the whole world drinks and makes whiskey. Uh, why do we only tend to see a certain demographic represented? These challenges in this sort of discussion is where I wanted to go with some of our guests. So we'll go to that now, if that's okay. And we'll speak to you later on another episode of White guys with beards. Don't you know whiskey is so much better than rum, 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 rum. Talking about diversity inclusion. Like a whiskey. Do I think the whiskey industry is worse than the rest of the world, better than the rest of the world when it comes to diversity and inclusion? Eh, probably about on par, which is frankly pretty shit. You know, the whiskey world is full of shouty men. I mean, it really is, this, this world online. And it's just very unpleasant. Uh, not least because most of them are shouting about things they know nothing about. I have boobs, you know? Wow. Who'd have thought? Um, this is revolutionary. Um, and I'm a buyer, you know? Whoa! The amount of times that people email Mr. Davies is quite fantastic. I can't call myself a whiskey expert because Laura's better. You know, it's like, you know, hell, she runs a distillery. And I tell my friends this, I'm like, yeah, it's like, it's not a, it's never about sex. It's about skill. When I first started writing about whiskey, I really became aware of this attitude that I perhaps wasn't taken as seriously because of my gender or even my age. And it wasn't until uh, just a couple of years ago that I realized that that's maybe a sentiment that's uh, shared by quite a lot of other women in the industry as well. It's just so stupid. It's, you know, I get the, all the time, oh, you write about whiskey. Do you actually like whiskey? No, I mean, you write about movies. Do you actually like movies? Like, is that something you would say to somebody? Oh, that's, oh, that is lovely, isn't it? Mm, I really like this one. So aromatic. Very floral, very floral. What are you getting? I'm getting a summer meadow. Um, are there any women here? <laughs> no, no, definitely not. No, 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 no women here. Why would there be any women here drinking whiskey? No, no. Whiskey is a man's drink. You know, our friends in the industry, female whiskey bartenders, you know, um, usually during service, you know, let's say uh, an older man would be there trying to order something. And, um, you know, they would wait there and they would wait for someone else to become available rather than placing an order with a, a female bartender, you know, just because they, they assume this female bartender knows nothing about whiskey. I think we've definitely moved away from this whole image of white wine for the last and lager for the last piece. And as stereotypes within other industries have moved away, you know, no longer are just a doctor's men and nurses women. As we move away from these sort of gender binaries within other industries, we're able to move away from those gender binaries within whiskey as well. Systems are maintained by people. And if people are so inclined, systems can change. I think the trade shows, you know, and I, this is a completely personal perspective, I think the trade shows need to change. I think they um, perpetuate um, norms that are no longer acceptable because they no longer reflect what's actually happening within bars, restaurants, and places where people are communing. And I think that they um, create uh, prohibitive access levels sometimes by the cost of a ticket. Uh, you know, why only if you have $300 can you go in and, and taste um, these things? Um, and I think that just excludes a lot of people. As a woman, I have been very, very fortunate not to have had much bias in my life. Um, and it may be because I'm a bit of an asshole, but, um, and, you know, I, I, but I haven't, you know, I am very, very well supported by my male counterparts um, 
you know, I couldn't ask for a better industry to a degree to have look, grown up in and, and been a woman in. They get your office supplies, plants so nice, off this jungle surprise, dawns plant well. Sometimes in Australia, we are a little bit backwards in some ways, where we're still focusing on just getting uh, females into the whiskey market, which, you know, is something that the UK has been doing for, for many, many years. So we're still working on very small steps to get to where we need to be. I think people shouldn't be too pessimistic because it's, there, there are always two ways. If you're thinking of pessimistic way, it can be just like that. But on the other hand, there are different things or different sides. Most of the people in cocktail bars, in whiskey bars, at whiskey shows, are women. Uh, the, more than half. And especially when you go to cocktail bars, probably 70 plus percent. Uh, and I'm at Proof and Company here. Most of our staff is female. Uh, I go to a lot of bars. They're usually, I mean, it's usually coin toss 50-50, male-female behind the bar, sometimes uh, even leaning a little bit more in terms of women, and not because it's like a women's job uh, to make drinks or something, but just because uh, it, it just is what it is. I can't even imagine what it would be like to be a young woman in this industry as a bartender. Like, you know, I've worked with many of them in, in previous bars, and man, the way they get looked over is heartbreaking. It's, it is different, you know, so when you're, you know, behind the bar and, you know, and I've participated in a bunch of these trade shows, often being the only rum at those trade shows, so <laughs> like whiskey shows with a, a side of rum who is like, I'm going to be the, your refreshing break. Um, I had to, to oftentimes fight for my authoritativeness there and, 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 and deal with that. And, um, but behind a bar, you kind of are, you're the gatekeeper. They need something from you. <laughs> it's back there. It's just, and I don't know why trade shows um, make people feel like they can not respect those boundaries. Um, but you handle them and you deal with them. I think some of my favorite moments, uh, Nicola Risk was actually one of my, uh, always paired with me at, at a lot of these trade shows. And I always just thought she was so great at handling those Guest, and she would put them right in their place with like incredible hospitality and she would out whiskey talk them and then they were so confused and would walk away <laughs> knowing they had just been schooled. I think we have come as an industry quite far for women. Um, you know, I think I can quite comfortably say that. And, you know, gone are the days that I'm, and, you know, I hosted whiskey shows with two white bearded men. It's not a few trailblazers anymore. There are women everywhere contributing huge amounts to the whiskey industry. The only way that this problem really gets corrected is if we get, you know, a lot of things around, you know, a lot of things around, especially racial tensions, have started really boiling up in the United States. You know, it's an argument you have with people when you, the, the counter to, you have Black Lives Matter become a movement, right? And everybody's like, well, but white lives matter and, you know, yellow lives matter and other lives matter. It's like, yeah, 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 no, we know that. This is the problem. But you don't have to say that. Nobody gets the point that when do we get to the point in society where we don't have to have a black lives matter or a woman's lives matter or who's because, yes, they do. And it's just the default attitude is everybody matters. <laughs> And welcome back to the Whiskey Revolution of White Guys with Beards. <laughs> ah, where do we start? Where do we start with that? I mean, 
I know where I started. The first whiskey festival I ever went to, the first person I went to talk to, to who would going to come with me to the whiskey festival was my daughter. <laughs> um, you know, the, 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 let's start a whiskey club. Yeah, my daughter. Let's start a whiskey blog. My daughter. So, yeah. I, yeah, women in whiskey. I, I, it, within the industry, I think the industry is fairly diverse. I think it's outside. You know, a couple of people mentioned, you know, do you even like whiskey? That happens all of the time, and it still happens today. I've seen it. You know, I, I quite often um, hire some really great women to work on the boutique whiskey stands at the London shows. Um, I'm going to give them a shout out if they're watching. Claire Vokins uh, also works a lot part time at the uh, so, uh, Millroys of Soho. And uh, Emily, Emily, um, who's not working with, used to work with us a long time ago. But, you know, these girls know an awful lot about whiskey and they're regularly asked if they even like whiskey. And it really does annoy me, but I like the way they shut them down because just like Nicola Whisk would shut them down, they would do it eloquently and teach them a thing or two at the same time. Um, actually, uh we're talking about you know getting women involved in the consumer side of um, of whiskey, and it's it's funny because uh, I used to be involved in uh, in a tasting group in London that Billy's now taken over a whiskey squad, um, and we were running a tasting group here in Bristol um, in the before times, and um, and we uh, also ran a festival for a few years called Granbury, and we we found we never really had any uh, any problem getting uh, women to come along, and also as regulars because I think it was. Um, I think it was possibly the way that we used to run our, ta <laughs> run our, run our tastings. This project, um, we we would always concentrate on the the experience, you know, and rather than sort of a competition to see who knew the most things about about it, you know, we would do all of our tastings blind. Um, so it's all about the experience you're having, and um, and it puts everyone on a fairly even footing. I know blokes tend to like to competitively know everything, um, and uh, and so we just kind of. Took that took a large part of that out. Um, and uh, what was what was the other thing? We also wouldn't do things like um, I mean, we allow people to to vote on their favourites, sure, but we never make it a competition. I, I kind of find that idea of a, a tasting where you have a, a competitive thing, like, which was the best one of the night. It's a bit uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, but, just little things. Like we that. men we men only understand winners and losers, Jason. That's okay. that's the reality. There has to be a top and there has to be a bottom. Well, which uh, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, that didn't come out right. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just conscious of, of, of this uh, of this fake beard. I'm thinking, are there any women here? No, 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 no. <laughs> um, but yeah, like it, it's it's. It, it, I mean, sure, we we occasionally get nights where we you, the balance would be out, but. Um, I think that was just down to dumb luck. So, um, Billy, I think we're doing an awesome job. High five. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah we... Sorry, the, one of the things that we, we need to remember, though, is the fact that, you know, as beautiful white men with beers as we are, um, there is a lot more work to do. And we're not... The, 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 we, well, individually, we, we can do what we can. We should continue trying to do what we can just to make the whole community open to everybody and inclusive of everybody. Because while we, we well, I know all of us all try and do these things, it's not universal and there is more work to do. And you know, while we can do little bits of sort of like a well done, high five, Jason, mm -hmm. um, we probably should. We should also remember that, you know, there is still, you know, a long way to go before everybody is welcome uh, mm -hmm. everywhere. And, you know, I'll. Jason's Whiskey Club now, my Whiskey Club, which I run with a lady called Elise. Um, we try and make it as welcoming to absolutely anybody who wants to come along, you know, just in general, no matter who you are. And yeah, most of the time it's just a bunch of white guys with beards in the room. But that's a different matter. That's just, you know, again, we're trying, you know, we just keep on trying to you know, do what we can. It's, yeah. But I'm glad you lead with that, Billy, that more work needs to be done because I agree with you 100%. When we had the Whiskey Jubilee and we were in New York, Chicago and Seattle, we had a policy and, and part of the contract that brands would sign was that we did not accept models for pouring behind the tables. You, you could send men, women, other, however it works, so long as they were knowledgeable about the product that they were pouring. And they were invariably 
brands who just wouldn't do otherwise. They would only send models. Mm -hmm. And it was hugely frustrating. The other thing that we tried to do, and I, and I love this from the video there, the idea that price, price point, we shouldn't go crazy on the number to even get in the door. And we would go out of our way to invite clubs, whatever your club was, whatever your focus was as a club, try and get you in the door en masse and purposely diversify the, the Jubilee. But it's a lot of work and we're all in it together and there's more to be done. And, and my comment on the way out the door here, Joshua says this, Joshua Hatton, my business partner, and dear, dear friend, it's our job to listen and implement from there. So um, we invite the uh, the comments and we will be listening. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's right. Part of it is appealing to a wider audience who make people feel welcome. Exactly as you said, there's more to be done. The companies already, we, we do see companies doing more, but there's more to be done. There were some great comments from some of our guests that we'll go to now and see, you know, how can we widen the, the message and make people feel more welcome? It is hard to actually put into words the extent of all of the deliberate barriers to advancement that were placed legally in this country for black people and people of color. Racism is uh, around the world. We cannot deny it because it's happening every day. So, so I felt it actually, but I, what, what I was thinking was uh, that when I felt something very strongly, Tatsuya told me, you are a woman, then you are Japanese, then working in UK, actually in Scotland, different. Uh, then you have to start from different. If you want to work in the industry, then you have to achieve something. You have to make an effort to catch up with like, uh, guys working in the industry. The problem is it's a lot of people that are writing the checks, um, and especially in the math departments of these big, huge companies, what they tend to do is to respond to a, a situation. You know, when Me Too happened, everyone started coming out and going, well, actually, you know what, we're starting doing this. You know, we're starting doing this. We put these things in places. Um, the Black Lives Matter, when that happened, suddenly these huge companies, Fashco was oh, you know, we're doing this, we're doing that. And it will always be like that until someone in these sort of big, in these exec boardrooms stands up and goes, you know what, let's do this, not because of what's happening on a global scale or what's happening on a local scale, but let's do this because it's the right thing to do, you know, which just sounds stupid. There is whole markets out there uh, from a business point of view, loads of markets out there that are being advertised to or are being shown to. And I think it's stupid. It's like I said earlier, this is for everybody. You know, it doesn't care who you are, where you're from, or who you're fucking. It's whiskey. All it cares about is if you like it or not. And that's it. <laughs> if the truth is, is that all kinds of people love to drink whiskey, not just white men, but all types of people. And it's time as an industry that we recognize that and acknowledge that. And we have to be more representative of that fact in advertising and the way that whiskey is marketed. And, you know, I, I think once we recognize this, this fact, like, it will be better. I mean, it's better, you know, why would we not address or recognize a large part of the client base that exists today? I mean, I, it, it makes no sense from any any reason economically. It, 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 there's no there's no reason why we market whiskey the way that we do, except that this is the way that we've always done it, which doesn't mean that it should continue that way. It just means that that's the way that that it has been done. Was it right then? No. And is it right now? No. So why would we do that going forward? They kind of have to take their audience as they find them. So like, you know, you let them taste it and you can see their reactions. You can ask them questions like, what do you like to drink? What do you normally drink? What are you into? What do you want to learn more about? All those kind of questions, which then takes it away from an assumption that, you know, women or, you know, different minorities don't like certain things, they're telling you their experience or they're telling you what they want to know about or they're telling you how they're reacting to what you give them. And then that makes for a better, you know, brand experience. Because certainly when it's happened, it's like it hasn't necessarily turned off 
the women in the club to the brand. But it certainly, like, raised some eyebrows and, like, oh, there's, like, if we're doing Zoom, there's, like, internal chats coming to me. Like, what does he mean? No, 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 we don't like this. And I'm like, oh, great. Now I, have to do, now I have to deal with it. Now it's my problem. You don't see a lot of, um, I guess, non-white bartenders. It's, like, it's actually already quite strange that these two Asian dudes own a whiskey bar in a very hipster part of Melbourne. It's, it, it's odd. It's definitely odd for people to see. You know, it's, not, it's not normal here. I would like to see a little bit more um, push, and I think it's changing anyway, but like in the marketing of stuff towards like, you know, people that, I never see anyone that looks like me in any marketing for any whiskey anywhere. <laughs> if you can see it, you can be it. And that's why, you know, myself, I try try put, uh, you know, I, I try to use the public to showcase what people can do. It's about seeing people working in production or if we have ambassadors or marketing. It's about showcasing people that you can see it and it allows others to be like, oh, I could do that too or that's what I want to do. It's really about showing that there are people involved and that that's what they're doing and that that's how they've achieved their, their dream or they've worked incredibly hard to where they want to be. So it's about just showing that there are these roles out there. It shouldn't be a factor. It shouldn't be, if I'm a whiskey maker, I'm a, I make whiskey. I don't care. Like I don't care if you're black or a woman or Chinese or how you wear your hair or what kind of beliefs you have about I don't know God or whatever. Can you make good whiskey? That is all I care about. If whiskey brands continue to only market towards men, and they're completely ignoring half of their potential market, and if actually 80% of consumer purchases for the household are made by women, so if women are doing the, uh, the weekly shop, the grocery shop, they're not thinking about purchasing whiskey for them because it's not marketed at them. And that's a huge, there's a, there's a business reason there for why whiskey brands need to start marketing more towards women but there's also an ethical reason there too because if we want people to stop questioning why women are in this industry and should women even be drinking whiskey then we need to start seeing more of them in marketing that's the way we change the narrative that's how we change the stereotype it's all about visibility and representation i've been trying to pitch whiskey stories to women's magazines for years and i can't I can't crack through because, and that goes to a whole machine of publishing, I'm sure, you know, they are more likely to spend their editorial pages on makeup stories because Maybelline advertises with them. Why are brands not say, and I'm going to just keep getting stuck on the advertising, why are they not taking ads out in L and Vogue? Why? I mean, we're talking aspirational products here. Who likes whiskey, all of this stuff. Look at, look at the cultural differences of running around the world with whiskey. I mean, that sort of points it out to yourself. Is there, it, it, it is, in a lot of ways, universal because it plays a part in almost every culture um, that you're doing it. So who's to say who likes whiskey? Everybody does. The Drumming Forecast Gordon and McPhail, moderate, becoming pricey. Boutique, silly. Diageo, difficult, becoming widespread. Compass Box, overly serious, occasionally epileptic. Signatory, grouchy, becoming drunken later on. Berry Brothers, red trousered, stalking grouse moors later on. The Freug, woody, weakening below 43 degrees. The Whiskey Exchange, sulking becoming brighter inexplicably. Secondary market, cyclonic, gale force nine. Waterford, smug. Malt review, self-important, with bickering later on. Thompson Brothers, Thatcherite, becoming populist later on. Dave Broom, beardy, word force eight. Charlie McLean, cyclonic, becoming monocled by half four. Blair Bowman, mild. Neil and Joel, lingering, losing identity. Chichibu, scarce, becoming flipped later on. Highland Park, Viking, becoming tiresome later on. Scotch Whiskey Association, strict, becoming hypocritical with tequila. Hunter Lang and Douglas Lang, subdividing. McAllen, silly, losing relevance. Bamore, silly, becoming stupid. Brooklady, natural.
becoming Woody later on. North Star, crouching, driving Tuk Tuk later on. Whiskey Base, fishy. Flippers, curious, becoming cunty later on. And that's the Dramming Forecast. Don't you know whiskey is so much better than rum, 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 rum. Talking about diversity inclusion. Like a whiskey. I think the reality is that whiskey isn't sort of split down the line 50-50 men, women, black, white or stuff like that. That's not, not, not the way it works. But, but I think it should be inclusive and welcoming of everyone. It's those old style sort of men, white men in smoking jackets that essentially sit around in armchairs on those lovely wing backs and just think that whiskey is for the elite. Um, I remember uh, Jack Milroy, he wrote me a letter once, he said, whiskey's made by a bunch of farmers in Scotland, it's a working man's drink. You go to Scotland or north of the border, it's all in pubs, it's a working man's drink. That's what whiskey is, it's made by the people for the people. You'll see that often whiskey's been portrayed as two sort of arenas. Drink this and you'll be successful and sex sells. And those are the two games in which whiskey companies, for the most part, and I want to say everyone, so I don't want to generalize, but a large proportion of people have been playing into. Whatever the rights and wrongs of what people in the industry or on that periphery of the industry do, there are so many other social factors at work uh, that govern people's attitudes to the way that women are seen, portrayed, and thought of in using spirits. I think people are vested in their own narratives because it's easier than facing truth. The idea that women don't want to drink whiskey, women were the first distillers. We called them witches and burned them. In, in China's reformation uh, in the 40s and 50s, the famous quote is that women hold up half the sky. Diversity and inclusion isn't an end goal, it's a journey. It's something we should always be working towards and that includes also doing the hard work in checking our own unconscious biases, being aware of the stereotypical thoughts that we have, and we all have them, but being aware of them, checking them and then making a change. It's a journey and you'll never be perfect but so long as you're taking steps on that on that path towards better inclusion, then the more diverse and, and better our industry will be. Forty percent of the executive board, even in Diageo, which is you know the largest uh, owner of, of single malt whiskeys, is you know are women. And by 2030, we aim to have at least half of of the board represented of uh, ethnically diverse backgrounds, and especially across the 27,000 employees around the world. So I think that, you know, whether we talk whiskey specifically or we talk about, you know, broad strokes on, you know, the agenda of where Diageo is going, I think it's always part of the conversation on how we can make, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion a huge part of even how we how we show up. And today we're still showing up in a great way with, um, you know, how we're providing opportunities for others, not just uh, just in terms of voices heard at the table, but making decisions on the brands, you know, global brand teams, executive level, and that's a pretty cool thing. And I think the biggest thing that we need to do is just education. It's that education on all levels of all things. Because a lot of, uh, you know, mistakes, a lot of uh, hurt that can be caused is just through ignorance. The more that we can focus on education, is, is the better that we're all going to be. So it's about learning how other people feel, how, you know, what, what, we can do to, to make sure that everyone's included. Race and gender don't matter. They just don't have any influence at all. So it's so easy to, um, to open the door there. The hard thing then is just inviting, making sure that somebody feels comfortable coming in and that it's, it's a safe environment for them. We can only see the tip of the iceberg, I think. And I think we definitely have a huge job to be done still. I think there still is a way to go to achieve uh, true equality uh, and representation within the industry. It's really important that people know that you need to have the conversations and as well that when, if someone does come out and apologise and try and work on themselves that they don't get attacked from the other side as well. Do you know what I mean? 
it's an education on all parts and we all need to help each other get through it. Preferably over a drink, right? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely lots of food for thought there i think it's serious let's take it away and think about it i hope you're watching this in a controlled manner not on your phone sitting there hearing all the tinny sounds beam it to a screen at least put on headphones to be able to hear all of the voices from around our whiskey world our whiskey our whiskey community i think it's time for a game dave i think it certainly is so let's um let's do that uh okay this is a game we started a long long time ago on afternoon tea and i think it's when the uh, the uncorked cowboy first came out and we did white dog and corn dog but we're just going to do real or no real on these distilleries here um okay so we've got a list of distilleries are they real or are they not play along at home pop a cork hold on how do we how do you screen. buzz in dave you need to buzz in by popping a cork i guess or oh. taking your hat off oh we haven't got i told you hats were mandatory um <laughs> popping a cork yeah okay so we've got a we've got a 10 distilleries to play with here are they distilleries or are they not false beard man has my t-shirt on <laughs> is yours brian is it yours okay are you ready eyes down looking here comes the first of our distilleries tonight is it real or is it not fainting goat spirits distillery Real. Yeah, it's, it's, Johnson Yellen pulled it, yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. It's, it's got to be one of my all-time. It's got to be one of my all-time favourite distillery names, and I can already visualise a boutique label. The distillery is in North Carolina, USA, founded in 2015, and making single malt just from 2019. Number two, Eagles Burn Distillery. Eagles Burn Distillery. Billy. Not real. Billy says, sorry? Not real. Not real. Ah, well, it is actually a real distillery. It's in the Netherlands. It's the owners of this Dutch distillery believe in long fermentations. The wort is fermented for at least 10 to 12 days. The distillery was founded in 2015, and their first three-year-old malt whiskey was released in October 2018. Mm. Mm. It sounded too real to be real. <laughs> Absolutely. That's right. why you've got to stick them in every now and again. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <Lock down>. <laughs> <laughs> Jason. Come on. That can't be true. That has uh, to not be real. No, that's one that our Jen made up. It's definitely <laughs> oh, not <Amber>. real. Uh, <laughs> Lock Amber. Uh, well done, Dave. That was a good one. Not me, that was Jenny. That was all. all, all oh, well done, ones. Jenny. That was yeah, fantastic, Jenny. Jenny. Yeah. Loch Amber. Loch Amber. The Gold Cock Distillery. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, I know Jason, be standing. Be standing. Oh, I'm going to have lost, lost confidence. I know there's a, a Gold Cock whiskey, but is it a Gold Cock Distillery? I'm going to say it's true. It is indeed, Jason. It is indeed. It's in the Czech Republic, um, founded in 1877. Now, I so wanted to bring a bottle of this back when I found some bottles of this in, in a little whiskey shop in Pilsen, where I was, but they wouldn't take a card and I didn't have any cash and I was flying out that night. And so I had to leave it there in the window. But I so <laughs> wanted a bottle of this gold cock whiskey to bring back. I would say, Dave, <laughs> you, you had a lucky escape because we've had bottles of that in Mortstock. And um, let's just say the were very, very full several years after they were first brought to Maltstock, which should tell you all you need to know educational Memorable. purposes Memorable. educational purposes okay the next one is the green oak distillery the green oak distillery uh, i would say it has to be it's so perfect it is almost so perfect but it's not it's oh! not real you are thinking of the white oak distillery <laughs> which is in japan it is indeed in japan the white oak distillery it is me on that one Green one. Yeah, we did. <laughs> oh, this is a sneaky one, isn't it? The SAS distillery. The SAS distillery. Am I going to get you? Standing. Yeah. I'm going to go real. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's real. It's going to be like <laughs> yeah, it's it's absolutely. Cool. Founded by Benedict Sass, a professional professor in organic chemistry. He personally designed this 200 liter column still. This is Belgian distillery. Uh, founded in 2004, has been making gin, rum, absinthe, and whiskey, according to old recipes. In 2019, they released a single malt bottled at 44% ABV uh, called Ignis Templi. Anyway, on to hmm. October Wild Distillery. October Wild Distillery. Is it real or is it Sounds not? like a porn star. <laughs> Fingers on corks. Get your hand wrapped around your cork. Oh no. Go Billy, go, go Billy. Billy. Go Billy. Go Billy. Not real. Billy. Uh, yeah, they got yeah, you yeah, definitely there is an October brewery, wild brewery, I think, in Ireland. October brewery. It's not a distillery. So yes indeed. Another one that Jenny um, found out for there. Let's have a look at the next one. The ginger mare distillery. The ginger mare. Is it real? Jason, that was you, you see any? Um, it's um, that's more of a big gut shift, isn't it? Um, that, that sounds real, and it sounds like it's probably American. It's not. No, that's another one. It's a gin mare you were thinking of. Gin mare, not ginger mare. Gin mare, ginger mare. It's not real. No, mm. indeed, it's not real. It's a made-up one that Jenny found in her made up names book so there's still uh, a business idea to be had there interesting yeah <laughs> who's, who's gin mayor dave uh gin mayor um there's a distillery gin mayor make make i have didn't write that down but there, it's um <laughs> i have heard of them yeah gin, anyway gin, uh, mare dave mare i do believe it is it's, it's all about the sea mate all about the sea mare. okay uh, mare. hey the next one is tin boon railway shed distillery uh and yeah we're going to make it real, aren't we? Come on, all of us are going to say real just to make it so. Um, yeah, if it's not real already, then we need to wish really hard at this point. Yeah, yeah, it is absolutely real. It's in Australia, it's it's, uh, founded in 2017. The distillery collaborates with a local brewery for their wash, which is distilled twice in a little 600 liter pot still. The first whiskey release came out in 2010, was matured in port barrels. And it's still their signature expression. Wow, that's brilliant. This is the last one. Kanasuki Distillery. Really? I, that's really... I, I, I have a hat of theirs, which I was meant to be wearing, but I left it in the other room. So <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously real. I've got, I've got some of their gin here. So um, yes, real, real, I would say. It's definitely real, absolutely. In Japan, owned by one of the leading shochu, shochu how do you say that, Jack, Billy? Makers Kagoshima. in the Kagoshima Prefecture. Um, founded in 2017. I've tasted their new make, or their new makes, uh, in, in, in a show in, in Tokyo a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, cracking um, new make coming through there. They were doing some different styles, but they have three copper pot stills, I think, starting big and go smaller and smaller. Um, and they, interestingly, they all have a copper uh, uh, worm tub condensers. Hmm. So, have we got a winner there? To top, total up the points. It's over to you back in the studio, Sam. Well, Dave, thank you for the game. Well played, everyone. We've had a great discussion around diversity, inclusion. I'd like to now move it to you were speaking about efficiency and that, that fine balance between uh, using a grain for the maximum output versus flavor. That's going to come up. But first surface level we all remember losing straws don't we at straws <laughs> <Lose them. Yeah. laughs> and now to the nature of things with david suzuki we have a very big responsibility for the future generation here in china uh you talk about straws plastic straws uh the chinese government passed a law uh in the beginning of 2020 and they gave an edict out to the all of China, and they said, guys, at the end of 2020, no more plastic straws, period. Just gone. Industry is going to die. So uh, if you're using plastic straws, switch out of it. The sort of get rid of straws one was a really good one to kick into everyone like, there's things we can do better. Everyone used straws. You, it was, you never, I, I've worked in bars for years. And I'd never even thought about straws being an issue. Obviously, there's 
loads and loads of other issues that need to be dealt with as well. I mean, even when bars were getting rid of plastic straws, right? Simple thing is that people made a big fuss, you know? And even to today, you know, people ask for plastic straws or can I get a... There is anger in the world paddocks today. Horses around the globe have spoken out against the ban of plastic straws. Horses have taken to social media using the hashtag SOS. The Save Our Straw campaign has gained international attention over the past 24 hours. Government leaders have attempted to reassure horses that the bans end at plastic straws and that this has been a grave misunderstanding. These are the worst scenes of discontent for 19 years when horses around the world spoke out against the unrepresentative portrayal of equine sporting icon Seabiscuit in the 2003 film of the same name. Chief Spoke Stallion for the SOS campaign had this to say, We horses have been taken for a ride for too long. It's time we said nay more. It's time we took action. More on this story as it develops. One thing that I'm a little concerned by is uh, the waste that comes with RTDs and bottled cocktails. And uh, while we are working towards uh, localizing our supply chain and working with uh, you know suppliers in our community to have craft spirits or whiskey or whatever, we also see from our side um, people creating RTDs that are then bought by bars and the UK or in the US. Imagine being a bar, stopping using single use plastic straws, but then you're happy to pour uh, individually plastic wrapped single serving cocktail that's been shipped from China using gin that was shipped from the UK to China using a glass bottle that was blown in China and shipped to the UK. Sustainability. Definitely there is a shift and the consumer wants to know and they, they want better methods for packaging. You know, they're challenging us as, as retailers and we're having to respond, be that with the information on the brands or how we're packaging our, our goods. I think that's super important. I don't think it's going to go away. I, I'm, you know, I'm fully, it's something I challenge my suppliers on consistently. Certainly over the last year, there's been a massive movement towards more sustainable packaging. I think a lot of whiskey producers are really considering the need to uh, maybe put their whiskey in a tube or a box anymore. They're looking at using sustainable, recyclable and reusable alternatives to plastic, um, particularly as we've all been at home and just ordering stuff online. I've definitely seen a move towards using cardboard and sustainable alternatives, which is awesome to see. I would say on sustainability, there's there's loads of stuff happening out in the uh, in the around the globe. Uh, uh, the big companies, frankly, are leading the way on this. Diageo has been, you know, looking at its climate and environmental and sustainability agenda for to, for well over a couple of decades now. So this isn't new to us. But in 2009, we set ourselves some new targets um, and to achieved by 2020 by 2015. Uh, and those were stretching at the time, but this is very much a moving feast. You know, we, whenever we achieve a certain level of performance, we, we raise the bar and look to do more and to do it better. You know, as we face the reality that climate change is real and we need to make serious adjustments to the way that we live, sustainability is becoming ever more important for whiskey drinkers and producers. Right? And every year going forward, it's only gonna become more and more of a priority. And you know, from the producers that I've talked to, you know, not just in the whiskey category, but across spirits, you know, making these changes is not the, making these changes is not only the right thing to do, but it often benefits the bottom line for producers as well, right? So, I mean, there are economic incentives for, for becoming more sustainable. Ecology, environment, sustainability has actually been with us for, for um, a very long time. And it just obviously keeps on getting more serious for, for the industries, for the companies. 
um, as government keep on uh, imposing or threatening to impose stricter regimes under which they can operate. So, for example, in Scotland, it's all the SEPA regulations around what distillers can and can't do with water and effluent and so on and so forth. So forth. Um, and what governments do is reflect the, the general thinking that's going on in the world. So, you know, it's all coming down onto um, people in distilleries to think very hard about what they're doing. People in distilleries, um, and uh, Scotch perhaps leads the way here, have also always thought about how you can do things more cheaply. If you are driving by efficiency, which ultimately kind of comes down to counting yield, then you're going to get penalized before you even get a chance to develop flavor. You're going to get put in a position as like, well, we, we need to get more extract. Because if we don't get the full extract, we're not fully efficient. We're not getting the highest yield, and therefore, um, we we're, we're wasting ingredients. There's a whole nother flavor profile that can be targeted that isn't as efficient. Again, a three-week fermentation using a brewer's yeast and not hitting a terminal gravity that is near zero, but leaving three or four so uh, two to three percent alcohol potential alcohol behind seems like a waste of ingredients but it gives you flavors that reside all the way through the process they carry over in the distillation they carry over in barrel flavoring and you can have a new flavor product that you can compete on there now once you have the flavor profile then targeting efficiency is a great idea and that means as you grow then selecting the right equipment to continue and the right processes to continue to have the flavor Airbus Airlines has unveiled their new prototype aircraft today the company released a statement earlier describing the prototype as a leading example of innovation in the pursuit of a sustainable aviation industry the company's CEO said that the designers at Airbus had really gone back to school in designing the aircraft, made completely from reusable materials. It's, it seems to have become another marketing piece of puffery, you know, the most sustainable distillery and all that sort of stuff. Do consumers care that much about thinking their whisk is sustainable? I'm not sure. And, and, and probably because, by and large, you know, whisky doesn't do too bad a job on these things and its impact on the environment you know compared to a steelworks or um coal mines and all of that sort of stuff is is not is is not huge i think the areas where it touches people maybe is around wood natural products peat although of course the amount of peat that scotch whiskey uses is tiny is about two percent of all the peat that's used in scotland in a year goes into whiskey making you know the rest is horticultural uses and stuff like that which are far more questionable but I think those are issues when where they're infect, uh, affecting habitats and natural environments for creatures, so like effluent disposable is disposal into the sea and stuff like that. Those those are the things that people will twig onto. I think one of the most challenging things for people about you know questions around sustainability is it is so complicated, right? And people want truisms. You know, they want if I do this thing this one thing, the world gets better. You know, if I just make this one choice or if I do this, then it's a better, the world is better. And sustainability questions just tend to be a lot more complicated than that, right? When we went to Portugal, then watched the forest of cork, then they explained that it takes about nine years to get cork from the tree. That's why they have to save the forest. Otherwise they cut down the trees and trying to make it as a, like uh, something else. So actually, the using cork sometimes can save the forest, they explained. Of course, the cost is much higher than using the screw top. But it's small step, but we decided to use a cork. The most inefficient closure is a cork. We continue to use that. However, until we get over the point of telling people that the Stelvin closure, twist tops, are actually better not only for this, uh, your whiskey storage, but actually still represent um, luxury because <laughs> you can reseal it and it'll be sealed. I mean, there's the number one thing right there. How many people, you you know yourself, if I, if I rip open a twist off 
whiskey for my guests that are coming over, or I pop the top off that's a cork top, there's a different message that's being sent. And that's some of the stuff that as consumers and just drinkers of whiskey, we have to get over. Well, booming things is good and it can change the world, but we have to be very careful to think of the boom. It can be changed in a year or two years. It's possible. But also, I don't think whiskey doesn't have a big power to change, change the whole world. But I believe whiskey has a possibility and the power to change our life. It's sometimes hard to remember that actually, as an industry, like we are not the biggest player, you know? <laughs> like whiskey does not change the wood market, you know? And like whiskey is not really moving the needle on like what happens in glass and packaging globally, you know? Like we're, we're kind of niche, you know? Um, and surprisingly, those are some really, really impactful things. Um, you know, like glass and packaging is such a big part of the industry's footprint. And, you know, ultimately, like, I'm not really in a position to change America's glass recycling policies, you know, as much as I would love to be. The earliest uh, uh, sustainability practices were feeding the, the hogs the, the, you know, the, uh, the leftover from the uh, production of uh, the, the mash. And uh, so uh, they, uh, Washington, uh, it was commented that his hogs were the happiest in, the, in, in, in uh, Virginia. You got to tell you just to do it in Scotland. Um, no, they use everything, even the hot water or, you know, uh, the spelt they give it out as cattle feeds. You know, I don't think it's actually talked about enough how green the whiskey industry is. With a major focus on sustainability, the whiskey industry is really turning from amber to green. I knew you'd like that. <laughs>
but we're also taking away a package for a, an entirely different reason. And I think one thing that, that we're always aware of with the consumer is the consumer doesn't want to feel like the wool is being pulled over their eyes. Yeah. They want to feel like they are getting max bang for their buck or their pound or what have you. And I think we in the industry and for us as an independent bottler, we're trying to show the way in which we support the consumer, but we're making wider changes as an industry. And balancing that is going to be tricky, but really our major focus through the rest of this year and beyond. I also want to say before my time is up here, this two hours has been amazing. The entire team should get a Jason B standing round of applause <laughs> because I cannot believe what you've achieved for these two hours. So kudos to the entire team. Well, we're running over two hours, Jason. So save your kudos till the end. Uh, you're absolutely right. We, uh, I have a massive thank you to give to a colleague that, that I'm saving till the next bit. Let's continue the sustainability conversation. Um, what you just pointed out is absolutely what comes up in, in, in a moment uh, here about the fact that it is gifted, uh, about the fact how do we move the value down the chain. Diageo has done a lot of work in this area and a lot of companies have. Uh, Jason Parker, we spoke to a lot of the craft distilleries are also passing on their profits in their higher premium product to the farmers. To the, mm -hmm. to the glass producers. If we pass it back to artisans down the chains, I think we can have positive change. So that's that's the discussion. Let's keep going. I love you guys. Uh, and now back to Body Break with Hal and Joanne. Sustainability. We've started about four years ago to create a solution that will make uh, distribution of craft spirits actually a closed loop and eliminate the packaging and single use glass bottles. Uh, exported to 180 markets around the world. You know, what's the footprint? What's the transport emissions related to the distilling emissions to, related to the packaging emissions? And that's all shared reasonably openly with uh, SWA. And in fact, we, we publish a lot of that online as well. So so these are the things that we can do to demonstrate leadership and encouragement. It's kind of generic stuff, if you like, that can really help the industry across the board. How much of it is uh, important for marketing and, uh, you know, how much it is, uh, you know, actually making a difference in the flavors, you know, it's hard to say. For a long time, we've trained the consumer, right, to equate quality with fancy packaging and very very heavy bottles right whether it's wine or whiskey or perfume right and and the global luxury you know products industry you know cutting across all categories is struggling with how do you connote luxury while making packaging more sustainable right and, and nobody's really figured that out and i think it's part of it is is on the producer side but also retraining the consumer to not value products just based upon the way that they're they're packaged right and, and and finding a way to somehow connote luxury without these things that you know for the most part often you know once they get home they're thrown away for me it'd be fantastic if even if it's just for the on trade you could see an option through suppliers to get the whiskey without any of that glamorous packaging. Packaging is particularly important, I suppose, because that's where, for example, in the whiskey industry and, and all their other brands, is where our consumers touch our products. That's where they start to feel what we're doing and, and understand it and our communications through our brands. So I, I think it's, uh, it's a hugely, hugely important agenda to Diageo. It's embedded in the way we do our business from right from grain to glass. Uh, and we really want to uh, demonstrate, I suppose, a leadership if we can, the leadership of the industry, a leadership amongst our peers and consumer goods companies to, to do the best we can. All the extra fluffery as far as like, you know, the hardwood case and that, like once I safely have the, um, the spirit, the bottle in my house, I don't really need anything else. Yeah, generally speaking, most of that POS can fuck right off. I mean, I have a, I have a rule with wine. Um, if the bottle's too heavy, doesn't matter how good it is, I won't miss it. 
you know, it, it's something that I, I've always kind of had that, that kind of idea in my head. Um, and, you know, I think it, it, it's important that we, again, we're the gatekeepers. We have the opportunity to challenge the brand. One big elephant, One big in, elephant the in the room is luxury, is luxury whiskey. And, and, and these, and are, the these are the worst offenders. offenders. I the and I remember the first time, time I when I got a pallet delivered, delivered and there was one bottle of whiskey on it. And it took up half the pallet. Half the pallet. Three quarters well, three quarters of the pallet. And, I, pallet. I, and I, I think I took a picture of me trying to carry this thing for one bottle of whiskey. And and it, it, doesn't it, it, it doesn't make sense to me, to personally, me personally, with my, with my simple mind, how, how the least the least necessary, necessary thing, thing in society, in society uber an luxury uber luxury thing, thing should get, the free, should get the free pass. I live in an apartment in New York City or in the Bronx. Or in the so, Bronx. Invariably, so invariably, I only have so much, space. Have so much every, space. Every, you know, extra, you know, extra box, large box, every weird configuration, every weird configuration means it's two, means or, three it's two or three bottles I can't put somewhere because there's weird things in the way and blocking my current storage capacity. If I get a case in and three are in the box and three are naked bottles out of the box, right? The three in the box will sell before the naked will. Because the consumer, when they're looking at it, goes, oh, it's in a box. I need it in the box. Or if the box is damaged and we have to throw away the box, we put the naked bottle. That's usually the last bottle that sells. Consumers like the idea. Consumers have heard of sustainability. Consumers like sustainability. Consumers know that it's good, so they want to participate in sustainability. They don't always seek it out. It, it, it's sort of, it is a maintenance factor that if it exists, it makes people feel good. But they're not just yet driving their purchase decisions solely or even primarily based on a sustainability. I think that a couple of good points were brought up too, that all the packaging, you know, what, what a couple of people said, all the packaging, do, people don't understand that as a sustainability, right? They don't understand that as a sustainability. They don't understand when, when the craft beer business in the United States started shifting out of glass and into can, the initial People didn't understand how much that was reducing transportation carbon footprint just because of the sheer weight that dead useless weight that was not being transported all the way across the United States so you could drink your, you know, your overhopped IPA. What is luxury? Luxury is scarcity and or sort of um, effort. Um, so as, as long as there's this massive sort of effort or I don't know how would we ever change that? That's the that's the hard thing. Because the people at the top want to want to see this scarcity or this effort that goes into a product. So I'm um, I'm really yeah worried about what the future is of luxury, or if there is another class that comes in underneath and then says that you know this is not what we think um, luxury is. Luxury is that local product down the road. The pandemic maybe has pushed us into some different ways of thinking about it, and hopefully we can take uh, some lessons and then progress them forward uh, into bigger sustainability and. Um, awareness. What I think is really important is that the education doesn't stop. So the, you know, the, the big companies like Diageo and especially on, on Johnny Walker as an example, were, you know, we're committed to making huge impacts on, you know, the environment and whether that is about uh, becoming net zero carbon by 2030, or it's about the replenishment of, of water, or it's, you know, the project that we're partnering with, uh, with Lauren Singer, Trashes for Tossers, or with, uh, with Ryan Chettier Wardana from uh, Mr. Lion's studio. I just think it's really important that the big brands like ours are making these big giant commitments, uh, what we can do on the grand scale. I think Champagne as a category um, has done the most for, for the environment in a funny way. You know, they're the ones that are doing future changes. I have to say that this is something I'm deeply concerned about is thinking about the waste footprint that is single serving individually packaged products that then ship around the world people drink and they go right in the bin right this is a problem that we should be thinking about i i don't know what the answer is i think about this so much because i don't i i don't know how to even talk about it we've totally fucked ourselves as humans <laughs> <laughs>
because yeah, I want to make the most responsible choices, obviously, of course, but that would inherently, automatically, that means that I am not going to buy Scotch whiskey because it comes from far away and its carbon footprint is tremendous, but it's still gonna arrive here. So I'm just leaving it for somebody else to buy. So why not buy it? But wait, that's irresponsible. I, I mean, it's you could tear yourself into shreds over it. We are growing together as an industry and we are helping each other out. So if there's things that we can do, we're, we're very, we're a very open community. We're very happy to help our neighbour. Still, we've got so far to go. We do feel a responsibility across our supply chain. And indeed, you know, in climate change language, supply chain is our indirect emissions, if you like, our indirect carbon. And we've got a responsibility to work with our suppliers to help them reduce their carbon, what we call our indirect carbon or our scope three carbon. And that's really much part of our journey. We've committed to cutting that by 50% by 2030. Uh, so we're going to cut our own emissions by to net zero by 2030, but our supply chain emissions by 50%. So that demands, that necessitate us to work closely to support our suppliers. And uh, and if our margins are good then and our profitability is well, then they'd expect more and more uh, reinvestment into our supply chain uh, accordingly. And that's been happening for, for decades. All, all I can change is like what, you know, from in my sphere of influence and I can just try and make the best decisions I can make inside the things that I can change. So, you know, inside distilleries, I think I try hard to be really conscious about which things I'm precious about and which things I'm, you know, happy to change. The size doesn't matter for the distillery or company, but always we have to think of some small things in our mind. Then maybe it can change the world in the future. And we're back for the last installment tonight of White Guys with <laughs> Me. Gents, you really brought your A game in terms of costume, first of all. Never mind content. Thank you. What is Jason wearing? Don't ask these things. Actually, you don't you don't ever want to know the answer to that question. No. This is just oh. my natural out of skin. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Uh, that's a corker, Dave. I love it. Uh, I was going to wear the uh, Kalila tattoo for you, but I missed out. Now they get out there. Get this, because this, every time I talk and I, I move my head, you get this little rattle. There's these bloody corks go around and around. I need to take the Timmy ends off. Oh, my people know this is not a practical hat, Dave. It's not a practical hat. Not from a... Oh, I can't see a thing either in those blind man glasses. <laughs> oh dear, this is all going hard with itself. <sighs> Lots of topics raised. Lots to discuss. This is our last segment. We're a bit over time. I wanted to try to get it to two hours, but you just can't with so many issues. So much has happened in this last year, this last decade, this last... 18 years that I've been into whiskey, maybe longer for you guys. It's been a, quite a ride, and there's so much to talk about. I miss you. I'd love to talk in person over a pint. Let's let's treat the next five minutes as such. Let's discuss anything that resonated with you in, in what we just saw tonight. Yeah, I'd love to circle back to what Lisa was just talking about there about it can be very overwhelming, and you can you can almost end up paralyzed because you don't want to commit to the problem. You do want to continue to enjoy your hobby. You can't just remove yourself from the chain. Other people are still going to be occupying that chain. And I think we come to whiskey, we come to spirits to relax, to enjoy one another's company, to forget about the trials and tribulations of the dumpster fire that is the world we live in. And so when those issues track us down in the place where we're trying to relax, it, it can become very difficult. And unfortunately, I, I taught philosophical ethics for the better part of a dozen years, 
I don't have an answer for you. I, I don't just get to go, and oh, there's the solution. But we're in it together. And if this is, to my mind, one of the best communities on earth, then let's continue to lean on each other. Let's continue to talk to each other. And let's continue to listen to one another. And let's try to solve problems as we go along enjoying our hobby. And you know, with that, you're saying you know, it is difficult, but we can, you know, do not be paralyzed by the difficultness. There are little simple things we can do. You know, and great little initiatives like I've seen you know, Brook Laddie are now doing their whole thing of we by default will not send you a tin. If you want a tin, press the button. There's no extra charge. You still have your tin, don't worry. But we won't send it to you unless you ask us. And so you have the opportunity to do that. I know um, at the Whiskey Exchange, we sometimes list gift box and non-gift box things as separate things at the same price. Uh, originally, that was for trade customers who don't want a bunch of boxes because we send in the first thing they do is they throw it in the bin. And, you right. know, often they get charged to take away rubbish. But, um, yeah, so you can do your bit. You know, you can go out and you can make your research. And while you're sitting there going, I don't want to stop buying whiskey entirely, you can then say, okay, let me look into what people are doing. Let me support the companies who are who are doing bits. Let me, let me try and, do, you know, every, the fact that there is an incredible amount of stuff going on out there, the fact it is incredibly complicated, we shouldn't forget the fact that yeah, we can make a difference. Maybe not a lot, but we can make some difference, and we should be uh, we should be happy to try and sort of be involved where we can. Absolutely, and um, I guess well, it's probably a, a rule for wider life generally. But but just like Billy said, don't 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 just sit there and be a passenger. But I think everyone should make a conscious effort to just try not to be a dickhead and and try to. You know, just try to contribute in whatever way you can to making things better. And, and you mentioned the whiskey exchange. One thing I've observed over the last couple of years is the way that the uh, the packaging, like the post uh, delivery packaging, has changed, and it keeps changing. And it, because you can see, they're trying to try out new things and balance those needs of sustainability versus having something which is um, going to protect the product. Because at the end of the day, you know, you might have the most environmentally friendly thing out there. But if if the bottles all are smashed, then that's not going to make anyone happy. <laughs> so you know, as as consumers, you know. But certainly make your preferences known, but don't leap down their throats. Like, yeah, just give people room to work on these things. Um, and, uh, and and let's all just try and make it all better. But actually try. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yes. That's a good addition. Yeah. And, and it's like, you know, as you say, Jason, you know, the, the, the rule for life, and it fits into this, you know, it's, it's actually uh, Will Wheaton's first law of the internet, <laughs> uh, which is don't be a dick. Right. And that, that that is Wheaton's law, and all should all people should know and credit it to the, the to 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 Wesley Crusher himself, Will Wheaton. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, we are Isn't lucky in this, well. in this community that dicks don't last. I think that there aren't many proper dicks in our whiskey world. Would you agree? There are a few hiding around. I wouldn't want to mention, but you know, yeah, you, you are right. We we do seem to, uh, as a community, again, the, the definition of what makes someone a bit of a dick changes over time, and over time, those people are sort of like you know, as as the definition shifts, people who start hitting the definition of people who aren't desirable in the community do get ousted and do get moved on and do get sort of like publicly, you know, held up as this is not what we want. This may be what we've done in the past. We want to move on from here and we are and we, we saw one of these last year i will not talk about which one it is but you know we have seen sort of like this whole thing of all the way through I, i've been working with you for a decade uh, as of like two weeks ago and over that time you've seen um what is acceptable change in everything from people to um practice to packaging to what people want to drink and it constantly changes and the whiskey community around it you, know, you when you see those little bursts of change you'll see this annoyance you'll see the the, the fighting signs but then one side will out you know we'll, we'll win and you know we'll become because the reason why there's been that change is because we've hit that tipping point each time where it's the time that it needs to change and you know as ever with the uh, if you've ever played a uh, civilization the the most addictive and excellent computer game of all time when you change your type of government you have two turns of turmoil, but then things get back to normal again. 
<laughs> Today's lesson. Thank you, Billy. I like that a lot. But but I think you hit the nail on the head where words, phrases, jokes that were acceptable ten years ago have have really now found themselves on the outs. And mm. I think all of us here, and I know all of us here, have led whiskey tastings where the enjoying a 12-year-old joke has been made, or I prefer 15-year-olds. And 10 years ago, that that was getting a chuckle in the room, and now it's getting sideways looks. Like, e even consumers in the tasting are saying, I'm not laughing at that, mm -hmm. right? And I, and I think that's that's become one of the most egregious examples that I really hope is on the way out. And, and then the, the other aspect, I think, is for us in presenting tastings, the low-hanging fruit is always the easiest. And I think as we deliver our own presentations, we have to be cognizant of where the easy jokes are and avoid them if the, you know, you know, they're no longer the right thing to be saying and bring the conversation back to why are we here tonight? What are we talking about tonight? You know, let, let's have those areas in common and make more people feel welcome within the room as we're talking about the fucking thing we're there for. That, I think that's the point of emphasis. Well, it is not simple. It's not a simple thing to navigate as an individual or as a brand or as a community of like-minded folks. I think tonight's program showed that. I don't think we have unanimous opinion across the board on any of these issues. And I think some of us feel empowered. Some of us feel weak, uh, hopeless, we, you know, weak and, and un unable to do anything. But I think together we're way stronger. And the small decisions we make, as you said earlier, Jason, what we do with our wallet, the decisions we make, the brands we support, the messages we send, the people we include um, will affect change. And it's the only way we can affect change. As Nicole said, as Ryan said, as so many people said on the call, um, it, this is the only way to actually do it in this, these small ways that might feel useless. This might feel like a trivial thing tonight, but it's something that we've spent a lot of effort on and something we all strongly believe in uh, to affect positive change in the way we can. So I'd like to thank you guys very much for being here. Dave, Jenny, Roz, myself, I put a lot of effort into this, but I want to give you guys a chance to thank John Minter because none of this would have been possible. This dream, this idea we had of creating this different world that also reflected, uh, mirrored us accurately in a strange, obtuse way um, was created by John Minter. And I think he deserves uh, proper recognition from all of us and from anyone viewing if you'd like to make a comment John, thank you so much. Well done, John. Bloody brilliant. Laughed my head off most of the way through that. Those sketches. The straw. The straw uprising. Yeah, the horse is confusing the message. Yeah, Don uh, Davies live from the jungle made me laugh out loud <laughs> alone in my office. It was fantastic. I, I may have been trying to screen grab every mention to try and send to things. I just got the message. Eventually just got one. just says, things have got strange. <laughs> in an appropriate fashion, things got strange. <laughs> well, you mean you guys can feel that like weird stuff too? I thought it was just me. <laughs> if you've been with the program all night, thanks for being here. This is live tonight, but it will remain online uh, continually. So, Jet, you know, Don, please do share. Uh, oh no, what did we say? Don will see what you did to her. Uh, everyone can see it. Please share it with your friends and, and spread spread as much uh, as as possible. Don't forget to have healthy snacks. Jason, Jason, Billy, Jan, uh, Blair, Whiskey Sponge, and all of our 30 guests who I'll list in a moment. Thank you so much for your support, and thank you for taking part in the World Whiskey Summit. Dave? Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much for watching all the way through. Thanks to our guests. Uh, yeah, huge thanks to John for putting this over. Uh, for, for for Jenny for putting the game together. And, and again, John for jazzing it up again. Um, I'm going to go and get changed because I'm off to another whiskey, whiskey day tasting to do. Um, it's been lovely seeing you all. Crocky, I want to see you and hug you in real life because I'm a champion hugger. Happy World Whiskey Day. Happy World Whiskey Day. Yeah. Happy World Whiskey Day. Cheers. 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 And that is good night. And thank you.
Who's got time to miss out on all of this deliciousness? Deliciousness. Go drink that shit. Whiskey. Whiskey. D -d deliciousness. Drink fucking whiskey. Drink all of it. 